Beloved of God, good morning. Welcome to the Kent United Church of Christ, an open and affirming and accessible to all congregation. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. For we do not come as perfect people, but we do come as people perfectly loved by God. Today, we celebrate the ordination of our very own Kim Nagy, our Minister of Faith Formation. We celebrate and honor her public witness to full-time Christian ministry. She was ordained yesterday at her home church in Dover, Ohio, and the flowers this morning, lovingly offered by Nancy and Don Bubenzer, are in celebration of Reverend Kim Nagy's ordination. We love you, Kim. We are so proud of you. Congratulations. Today is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Morning. And on behalf of Christian Education and our Sunday School teachers, I invite all of the church, the infants, the toddlers, the school-aged children, our teens, our young adults, all the way up to our wonderful sages who lead us to worship with us this morning. Please join me in this responsive call to worship. We who dwell in the shelter of the Most High Seek God here. We who come to be inspired and changed, seek God's spirit here. We who know how little we know, seek God's word here. Thank you. For our invocation, let us pray. God, you are made known to us in the rustling wind that blows, in the blazing fire that does not consume, in the face of the good, in the depth of the unknown. We meet you here. We accept your greeting. We welcome your inspiration. We await the change you have in store for us. Draw us into you. Inhabit our spirits. Focus our attention. Bring us to you, you who are already with us. Help us to be as you would have us to be. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you 
and the Holy Spirit, here and everywhere, now and always. Amen. Friends, as we confront the confusion, chaos, uncertainty, and the disorientation of a new school year and a new church year, I invite you now to share the peace that Christ offers all of us. It is the peace that passes all human understanding and reminds us that no matter what is going on in our lives, that we are never alone. So hold your hands up to the screen or send those messages of peace via text or make a call to someone to offer them the peace of Christ this morning after worship. May the peace of Christ be with you today and always. Well, our scripture reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, which you will hear Grace read in just a few moments. As we prepare now for confession, let us consider the questions inspired by the Apostle Paul. Let us pray. Lord, we ask ourselves this morning, is our love always genuine? Do we resist the evil that we see? Do we consistently seek to serve God? Are we hospitable to strangers? Do we offer blessings to our enemies? Do we have close relationships with people who are really different from us? Do we seek revenge on those who have wronged us? Good friends, we do these things. We do them often, maybe not all at once, but they are actions that are part of the human condition. They are also actions that turn us away from the love God offers us. In this time of confession, God invites us to examine all of this and to repent, which really just means to turn back. Let us confess our sins, and as we do, let us turn back. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that our love isn't always genuine. We see evil and wring our hands instead of resisting it. We forget to consider more ways to serve you. We turn our back on strangers who could benefit from our hospitality. We do not pray enough for our enemies. We associate with our own kind, fearing the other. We relish in fantasies of revenge. For all this and for all the burdens of our heart, we lay them before you today, O oh God, and we seek your forgiveness. Have mercy on us and hear our prayer. God's mercy extends beyond the bounds of even our collective imagination. 
God's love seeps through any wall we could ever put up. God's goodness holds more power than the sum of all sin. It is because of that extensive, seeping, powerful, and bold love that I declare to you, in the name of the blessed and holy Trinity, that God forgives us all our sins. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Listen for a word from God. 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. 10. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 11. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. 18. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 19. Be loved. Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. 20. No. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here ends our scripture reading this morning. Thanks be to God who is still speaking. Earlier this summer, we gathered to discuss the movie Just Mercy, the story of Brian Stevenson, a young lawyer called to defend those wrongly condemned on death row. This work led him to founding the Equal Justice Initiative, an organization working on behalf of those unjustly trapped in the farthest reaches of our criminal justice system, or what some would refer to as our criminal injustice system. Brian wrote a book about his experiences called Just Mercy, a story of justice and redemption on which the movie is based. Brian has brought to light the scourge of mass incarceration, or what he would call modern-day slavery, for many of us across this country. And for an even closer look at mass incarceration and its role in the ongoing repression of black lives, you may also want to watch the documentary film 13th, which was the first movie we discussed together this summer. Just Mercy is the perfect follow-up whether you read the book or watch the movie, it gives a personal glimpse into what those unjustly condemned and living out their lives on death row experience. After decades of defending those whose primary crime was being black, defending the poor, the desperate, and the innocent of crimes they never committed, Brian, a man of deep Christian faith, can still proclaim this, and I quote, we know something about grace. We know something about redemption. We, the church, know something about mercy. As followers of the one who was the embodiment of unconditional love, acceptance, and grace, we do know something about these virtues because we although just as human as anyone else, we have experienced the grace and love of Christ. But what does it look like to respond to that grace after you've received it? Once you've been transformed by the love of God, what next? What does that ask of us? The Apostle Paul gives us some clues in today's reading 
Hear again this wise counsel. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is one of my favorite passages one of the clearest and most succinct litanies in all the Bible, laying out what it means to behave as a Christian and lead a spirit-led life. These instructions, or marks of the true Christian, as they're often referred to, move us from simply claiming an identity as a Christian to outlining the behaviors of one who actually follows Christ. Paul is sharing with the early church in Rome this ethic of grace, this ethic of love. If lived out, this ethic is not only for the church, but it has the transformative and redemptive power to change the whole world, beginning with our own community, if we live by it. But this ethic Paul lays out calls for, for, for some pretty tough love. For what is tougher for human beings than to turn away from evil with good, to respond to injury or insult with a blessing? After all, as writer Catherine Matthews asks, doesn't it feel good to give food, for example, to people who we feel and judge are deserving of our help? Yes, but many folks find it galling to give to someone who they have determined doesn't deserve it. And yet, as Hank Langnecht put it so clearly, Christians are not allowed the indulgence of having enemies, nor do we have permission to assume that we are right. Do we doubt that the world would be transformed if millions of Christians refuse to have enemies or to assume that we are always and thoroughly right? As Christians, we are not allowed the indulgence of having enemies. This is what Paul is teaching us and what Brian Stevenson is modeling for us. After all, if we do know something about grace, mercy, and redemption, then we have to act like it. I can't help but think of the parents of the Amish children who were senselessly killed by a gunman in their one-room schoolhouse in the old order Amish community of Nickel Mines in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. After he took the children hostage, he then shot eight little girls, killing five. Their families gained national attention for offering forgiveness to the shooter, 
even though he himself had died of suicide. The Amish emphasis on mercy and reconciliation was the living out of the Apostle Paul's words for what it means to behave as Jesus would. Again, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says God. I also think of my own mentor, Fray Uvo Markovich, Bosnian Franciscan priest, who was expelled from his monastery during the Balkans War when a young enemy soldier pointed a gun to his head. Prepared to die, Evo somehow managed to look the boy in the eyes and tell him that God was with him even then, would forgive him, and loves him unconditionally. Standing there for what seemed like hours but was a mere few minutes. With the gun pressing into Evo's forehead, the enemy soldier broke down, started to shake, and eventually lowered the gun. Unharmed, Evo embraced the soldier. In his book, Just Mercy, Brian tells the story of an old woman who visits the courtroom where he worked. She came every day. Her grandson had been murdered by other teenagers. At the end of the trial, convicting those boys to a lifetime behind bars, a stranger in that courtroom came up to her to comfort her. She had never seen this person before, but it meant the world to her, as you can imagine. Now, she comes to the courtroom to comfort others. It doesn't matter if they were the ones wronged or if they were the ones who did the harm. I decided, she said, I was supposed to be there to catch some of the stones people cast at each other. And then she recited the biblical passage of the woman accused of adultery who was brought to Jesus and Jesus said to those who had come to stone her, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. He's, he's remarkable. Jesus' brilliance was his compassion that saved the woman from her accusers. He forgives her and urges her to sin no more. The old woman in the courtroom told Brian Stevenson that he was a stone catcher too. Well, three years ago this weekend, you may also recall the heinous hate crime that took place in Charlottesville, Virginia, when Heather Heyer, a peaceful protester and activist, lost her life when a car plowed into a crowd of counter-demonstrators who were protesting a rally of white supremacist nationalists. The driver of the car was from right here in Ohio. When Heather's mother was later interviewed, she offered forgiveness to the driver who ran down and killed her daughter. Now I can't help but be honest, as a parent, how would you feel would you be the first in line to cast the first stone at that driver? Friends and followers of Jesus, the one who caught stones and did not cast them, as followers of that one, Jesus, our witness to the world, in addition to the joy we shared on Holy Humor Sunday, which is such an important part of our witnessing to the good news, our witness to the world is also our willingness to bear the burdens of others, to bless even our enemies, and to discover the beauty in everyone, and to leave the judging and vengeance to God. Like Brian Stevenson, 
and the Amish families of nickel mines and Bosnian Franciscan Ivo Markovic and Heather Heyer's mom Susan. We too are called by Christ and exhorted by Paul to be stone catchers, to stand in front of those who would hurl stones as if they themselves are without sin. Catching stones, responding with tough love, even to our enemy and to those who want to harm us. This has the power to lead to their change of heart. But not until our hearts first have been changed. And you can only catch stones, my friends, if you're tough. You've heard me say before that if loving, as defined by Jesus and detailed by Paul, if loving like that were easy, we'd all be doing it. Our world would be a different place. But this higher love that Jesus calls us to, this tender and tough love, demands courage and conviction and the readiness to speak up and out to bear others' unjust burdens, and it demands humility and vulnerability to acknowledge our own brokenness. Let's be honest. <laughs> Hurling stones is much easier. But that's not the task of the church. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also understood this. This past Friday was the 57th anniversary of his I Have a Dream speech, August 28, 1963. He cast a, vig a vision that inspired a nation, an, an entire generation. 57 years later, this dream lives on, and we must ask ourselves, how far have we come on this journey to the social justice the gospel of Christ lays out, and what must still be done to achieve the dream King so eloquently articulated in 1963? As individuals and as the church, are we still casting stones or are we catching them? I don't think the church is judged by the size of the buildings that it creates. I don't think it's judged by how many members we attract. We're not judged by the beauty of our music, the power of our uh, testimony. We are judged by our witness in a world where there's slavery and terrorism and segregation and mass incarceration. What we say in response to that is how we're going to be judged. You know, we read in the scriptures uh, that Jesus condemned those who wanted to throw stones at the adulterous woman. And uh, he made them feel shame and they went away. Uh, and he told her, go and sin no more. I think today uh, that scripture is still there. That challenge is still there not to judge. Uh, but people are picking up stones and throwing them left and right. And I think the new church this church has to be willing to be stone catchers. We've got to be willing to stand in places where we bear the burden of those who have been wrongly accused and condemned. We bear the burden of those who are being uh, presumptively treated uh, as if they're dangerous or guilty. We have to bear the burden of those disfavored communities in our country and across the world, those religious minorities, those sexual minorities, those undocumented communities, people who are black and brown. We have to bear their burden. We have to stand up and catch the stones that are cast to them. And then we make a witness, then we make a statement about our faith that is empowering, that's transformative. And so I'm excited uh, to be among a community of people who are trying to do that. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've been given great tools to do it with. Uh, we know something about redemption. We know something about grace. We know something about mercy. We know that we're broken, but our brokenness doesn't define us. It just opens us up uh, to what grace and mercy can do. And that's the secret weapon that I think we have to employ if we're going to confront racial bias and racial inequality in America. May God grant us the courage to be stone catchers.
If those of us who know the grace and love of God, however undeserving we are, do not catch stones cast at others just as undeserving, well, if not us, then who? I say to you today, my friend. I say to you today, my friend. Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. I still have a dream. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men all people are created are equal. Created Toda la gente fue creada igual. I have a dream that one day, on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Yo tengo un sueño hoy. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh shall see you together. This is our hope. This is our faith. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords the of our jangling nation discords into a jangling of discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, a trabajar juntas y juntos, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail to together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. My this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. Que suene la libertad. Let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. This must become true. This must become true. This must become true. Let freedom ring. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California, but not only that. But not only that. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain in Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day. We'll be able to speed up that day 
with all God's children. Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spirit. Free at last. Free at last. Finalmente libre. Free at last. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Mother God, your word tells us that creation groans in its waiting for you. Well, that's us. We are your creation and we are groaning. We're scared about getting coronavirus, but we're also worried about the mental health of our kids and ourselves as they go back to remote or partly remote school. We're worried about our friends and family getting COVID-19, but we're growing weary of not seeing them like we'd like to. Some of us have loved ones who are very sick with the virus or other serious diseases of the mind and body. Some of us have lost our loved ones and have sat at their deathbeds. We groan over our losses. There has been so much to grieve for and there are so many more unknowns in the next couple months. And we need you. You also tell us in your word that you say our names and sing over us. Can you do that now? Can you hold us, shush us, rock us, and sing of your love to us? We need your comfort so desperately, especially when so many of us are trying to bring comfort to others right now. We need a refill of your peace that passes understanding. And in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, the continued pandemic that kills black and brown bodies day in and day out continues to rampage through the lives of our brothers and sisters. The police brutality seems unending and has nearly taken the life of yet another black man, Jacob Blake. On the day that we are celebrating the 57th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, in which he speaks about the dreams he had for justice and equity for his young black children, we have to reconcile that in the year 2020, another four young black children had to watch their father get shot in the back seven times by a young, white, trigger-happy police officer. They groan. We groan. Our own dreams seem simple and obvious here. We want it all to stop. Now, we don't want another video. We don't want another hashtag. Another police department to barrage with phone calls and emails. The nightmares of white supremacy, racism, violence, brutality, corruption, and oppression just keep winning out. What is your dream? Give us soft hearts so that we can hear you when you tell us that you are calling us to put an end to these nightmares. You are calling us to stop sleeping and wake up. You are calling us to the wakeful dream of undoing the racism in our own hearts so that we can undo the racism in our communities and our country. The dream of living in a world that not only says, but acts like black lives actually matter. Give us the courage and stamina to follow Jesus when he asks us to always be on the side of the oppressed. Show us how to enter our circles and advocate for our black brothers and sisters. To ask for history curriculum that isn't whitewashed and black history and black literature all year round at our schools to ask for anti-racism training at our jobs, to ask for community oversight of our local policing, to ask for equal housing opportunities at our city council meetings, to ask for the church to take responsibility for the harm it's done and to work to undo it. Give us the love and wisdom to fulfill the dream you gave to Martin Luther King Jr. And as we close today, we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. 
our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. This performance is for our friend and brother in Christ, Rob Montgomery, who sadly passed away last weekend. We will always remember Rob as a kind man, an amazing musician, and an important member of our church and Kent community. We will miss you, Rob. This ain't coming from no prophet Just an ordinary man When I close my eyes I see The way this world shall be When we all walk hand in hand child cries for a crust of bread when the last man dies for just words that are said when they're shelter over the poorest head we shall be free when the last thing we notice is the color of skin the first thing we look for is the beauty within When the skies and the oceans are clean again, then we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free. Stand straight, walk proud, cause we shall be free. from our own kind of you then we shall be free oh we shall be free we shall be free have a little faith hold out cause we shall be
last Saturday, 13 of us from Kent United Church of Christ attended the Generosity Festival organized by our UCC Living Water Association. We were reminded of the importance of setting up an online recurring gift to the church so that we are consistently funded and our ministry and mission can thrive and continue even during a global pandemic. And so we invite you this morning to give all that you can back to the God who has given you life itself. This is a fifth Sunday as well, and you know what that means. A fifth Sunday here at Kent UCC means that we are also invited to contribute to the Congregational and Community Assistance Fund, or CAF, as I've started to call it. The Community and Congregational Assistance Funds allows us to support anyone in need, both in our church and outside in the wider community. Please do send separate checks or make a separate online donation to CAF. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Join me now as we dedicate our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Beloved of God, members of this body of Christ, we have been enlivened by the grace of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with you to serve and transform lives, our community, and the world. This is our mission. This is our calling. And this is the spiritual and moral task to which we have all contributed to in the offering of these our gifts, Lord. Please bless them as we dedicate them to you and to the world you have entrusted to us. Amen. Friends, just as we dedicate our gifts, our monetary treasures, we also dedicate gifts of time and talent, and we dedicate our children this morning as we prepare to go back to a school year that is unlike any other. And so this morning, we want to offer a special blessing for all of our children, youth, and young adults returning to school and to their teachers, administrators, and professors. Please raise your hands to the screen and join me in asking for God's blessing on our students and teachers as they begin a new and unusual school year. God of wisdom, we give you thanks for all the places where we will focus in to learn this year, in schools and classrooms, and at kitchen tables, and on couches and beds. We give you thanks for the teachers and students who are present in each of these spaces each day. We thank you for the beginning of this new school year, for new books and new ideas. We thank you for sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, laptops, tablets, Zoom, and crisp blank pages waiting to be filled. We thank you for the gift of making mistakes and trying again. Help us to remember that asking the right questions is often as important as giving the right answers. Today, we give you thanks for your beloved children in our congregation, 
our students, and our teachers. And we ask you to bless them with curiosity, understanding, respect, and a bravery to embrace the unknown. May their backpacks, briefcases, teacher bags, and devices be a sign to them that they have everything they need to learn and grow this year. May they be guided by your love. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who as a child in the temple showed his longing to learn about you, and as an adult taught by story and example your great love for us. Amen.